Um, it's usual to have the audience ask the speaker questions at the end of a, of a talk. Uh, and I'm going to do it the other way around. I'm going to ask you a question at the beginning. All right? And the question I'm going to ask you is about wind turbines. I think you all know about wind turbines and, bet and uh, half row AV cube and all that stuff. And the question is, if you have, if you believe in Lanchester Betts' theory about how to get the best efficiency, but you have them close packed, uh, Lanchester and Betts say we want to have the wake velocity a third of the incoming velocity. So let's pack them closely. Where does the other two thirds of the water go? All right. So perhaps you could uh, ponder that. Um, that's what you're used to, and I'm saying that this is wrong. Okay, and I've got to convince you all that this is wrong if we are working in tidal streams. We're taking uh, ideas from wind without really thinking hard about what happens if you put them into uh, 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 something like the Pentland Firth. In a wind turbine, if you're too greedy with the blades of a wind turbine, then the air can say, well, why should I do anything for this guy? There's an easy way around the top or around the side. But in the Pentland Firth, the water can't go into the seabed, and it can't go into Cape Ness, and it can't go into Orkneys, and it can't suddenly jump over the top of your equipment. So it has to go through, and it has to raise enough head, and the more greedy you are, the bigger the head it's got to raise to get through. Okay? Now, uh, a very good... That's the, oh, that's the reminder of the question. Where did the other two go? A very good thing when you're starting a new project is to understand every energy flow, every single one, all the heat and all the vibration and all the velocities, the whole lot. And the first thing I thought about when I wanted to look into tidal streams is how much energy are we losing on the seabed? And you know, right going around corners and past islands and things. And the very obvious way to do this is to put a... Um, Come on. This is not working on. Uh, to put uh, something like this, this is an acoustic Doppler current profiler. Can you see? Oh, you see the little. Here's an acoustic Doppler current profiler. This is measuring the velocity of the water at different depths above it. And they also have inside a little pressure transducer. And they have a, a thing for storing pressure signals for about a month. And what we want to measure is the slope of the water. Here's the slope coming down here, in one direction of tide, and the slope in the other direction. And if you could do that, if you put a row of maybe 20 uh, acoustic Doppler current profiles off uh, along the entrance and the exit of the, of the channel, measure the slope of the water, uh, you'd know exactly the velocities and the pressures, so we know the head, and we know everything about it. And uh, we need, they cost about 20,000 each. So it's not cheap to do, but it's, uh, it's going to give you some valuable data that's worth doing. Unfortunately, come on, this isn't working. The Pentland Firth is thought to be too regional by people uh, living uh, somewhere down the south. So how else could we do it? Well, we might be able to do it I'm going to do it here. Let's try this. That, that works, yes. Can we calculate this from a, a, a flow velocity map? Uh, now, I was able to get uh, a flow... Can you see the mouse? Yeah, here we are. This is a map of, of, of Scotland. Here's John of Groats. Here's Orkney Islands. Um, and these velocities are giving you... Uh, th these colours are giving you the velocities of, of the, of the, through, the, through the channel. And we know the area of each of these... Uh, squares, and so we can use an equation for bottom friction. If we, if we have an idea about what the bottom friction is, we can work out what the total losses across that are. And it works out that <coughs> they are uh, six terawatts times whatever number you want to have for the bed friction. So what you could do is you could calculate bed frictions, all the, the collection of all the different bed frictions, 
uh, going from supersonic fighters up here down to various things that happen when there's waves as well as tides. And the one that came uh, closest to what I believe to be correct is that by a chap called Campbell me measuring them in the Menai Strait, which is another um, place where there's uh, sort of tidal activity. And uh, I, I, my guess was to be just a little bit under him of, two no uh, of 0.016, and that's the red one. And I asked Ian Bryden, um, who knows a lot more than I do about tidal streams, what his figure for the, uh, the bed friction was, and he gave me the number 0.04. Now, if you take my number, that uh, take our six terawatts and multiply it by, by the 0.016, you get 98 gigawatts being wasted on the seabed. Uh, and a lot more, of course, if we use Ian's. Now, there is a lot of confusion about this because uh, engineers who are making airplanes and ships uh, think about drag with a half of rho v squared, and the oceanographers um, don't have the half. So the, the, there's two lots of people talking about the same subject using a factor of two difference between their, their numbers. So whenever you read anything or whenever you write anything, think, is this guy an engineer or is, it, is he an oceanographer? He on the same as well. Okay. Um, I would like to have either an O or an E after each statement of what the, uh, the friction coefficient is. All right, let's try and see what friction coefficients might be. And uh, that is a picture of um, giant kelp. And there's lots of giant kelp growing in the Penton Firth wherever there's enough light. It goes down to about 30 meters depth. Uh, if the, it's in a very high velocity place, they get wrenched out and uh, washed downstream. But uh, they can go three and a half meters long, all right? So that's uh, not indicating a very high drag coefficient. I don't know what the friction coefficient would be, but a bit high. Here's, I've got miles and miles of pictures like this taken an ROV that was cruising around the Pentland Firth. The little white thing here is uh, 60 millimeters in diameter. So you can get a rough scale for the size of the rocks down there. Uh, we can also look at a map of the Penton Firth. And it's not really very much like a Venturi tube when you look at the shapes of those things. You've got these, lost my mouse, here we are. We've got these islands here, Swona and Stroma. Um, you've got headlands jutting in. Um, I keep losing my mouse. Let's, I'll see if this has come to light again. No, I've lost that. Uh, so you've got all these headlands. You've got places where there's a sudden drop down to 100 meters depth and places where it suddenly goes up to about 30 meters. Average is about 70. And that, that really doesn't look like a nice flow passage. Uh, we could do a thought experiment by imagining that Swona and Stroma, those two islands, have been sliced off at the seabed and we want to tow them out. And we want to tow them out at, uh, uh, let's say, I don't know, six knots. And we asked the tug operator, what power tug would you want to tow those islands out? Um, and uh, you can do this on yourself. You can work it out. Right. So um, let's now compare that with this thing, which is the uh, from a book by Abton von Donhoff, which is a wonderful book to get. You should really, really own one. And it's the, uh, the, the, the drag uh, and lift coefficients of uh, the sort of uh, aerofoil section you might use for a guided missile fin. It's a NACA 306. <coughs> and you can see that with the standard roughness, uh, I've lost the mouse again, here we are, standard roughness curve here, uh, they're giving a, a number of, is that 0 0.009? <coughs> well, we want to realize that there's two sides to a guided missile fin, so, uh, and the seabird's only got one side, so we could halve that because it's a, a single side thing, and then we can halve it again for the fact that we're talking about oceanographers um, rather than engineers. So um, we could come down to uh, a quarter of that value, but the official estimate for the Pentland Firth is 2 naughts 
Uh, and this is the, these guys have been paid a lot of money to tell the government how much energy there is in the Pentland Firth. And that's the number that they're saying in a paper that ridicules my estimates of it. Um, and I think this is, the, the, the only reason they gave for this, they said it was traditional. And I think the reason for this might be that it, if you had uh, ooze falling down from an ocean onto a seabed for millions of years, it's producing a surface a bit like gloss paint. So maybe there are enormous amounts of the of deep ocean which have this sort of uh, bed friction coefficient, just like the gloss paint. And the, the, what they've done is they've assumed that what's right for the deep Atlantic, which is in books by people like Pew, a wonderful book, um, is applying to a place where we've got all these jutty islands blocking in. So uh, that's, uh, uh, that, that's the position about bed friction. Uh, which friction coefficient shall we use? Well, the next thing we might think about is looking at the peak velocities of the spring and the neap tide. And what you can do is to compare those with the, the driving force. And I got a set of uh, amplitudes and, and uh, phases and uh, periods for the astronomical forcing function. You think about the sun and the moon and other bits of pulling on the water all the way across the Atlantic up to Cape Cod. And you can put those all together. There's a list of amplitudes and periods. And in this particular list, the, the dominant period, the, what's called the M2, is given 100. That's an arbitrary size. And the others are, are related to that. So the, the S2 period is 46% of the M2. And this bit of algebra at the bottom allows you to construct a signal, which is the astronomical forcing function. And we can compare that. Uh, the, the astronomical forcing function is the top curve. And we can compare that with a real acoustic Doppler current profile signal, uh, signal from the Pentland Firth. And if you look at that, they're not really all that similar. Uh, if you look at the ratio of the highest peaks to the lowest peaks. If you look around here, if I can, yeah, if we look at these ones here compared with these ones here, there, and then compare it with what's happening in reality, you can see that the ratio of the high ones to the low ones is, is, is not really the same. And if you think about the way square law friction works, the higher the velocity, the more the drag. So you'd expect the biggest velocities to be chopped more than the small ones. And uh, that would be a way where we could, if we had a long enough record, perhaps work out what the losses were by seeing how much more the big ones were knocked down. Unfortunately, they only can put these things out for a short time, about a month usually, and so we haven't got all that many uh, data points to work with. So it, it would work if we had infinitely long amounts. So peak losses is not enough data points. Uh, the next thing we could look at is the slope of the zero crossing velocity. Uh, if you know, if you've got an ordinary regular sine wave and you know the amplitude, you can work out what the slope would be at zero and also vice versa. So we could look at that and this time we can construct a, a, a velocity signal and uh, here is a, 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 a sort of Ohm's law for, for currents. The velocity u is something like voltage or force uh, divided by uh, things which are like resistances. And I've got a Z there for representing the impedance of all the water flow across the Atlantic from Cape Cod. And this will be behaving like the, uh, the coaxial cable. Um, and the people who haven't done electronics might be a bit puzzled about why some cables in the electronics lab have got 50 ohms written on them when uh, uh, clearly if you measure it with a, a meter, it's a very good conductor. And the reason for this is that uh, electricity can't go along uh, a, a very fast signals in it. It can't, can't go instantly along a cable. And I'd like you to imagine that we're putting a signal into a cable. We're suddenly raising it up a step uh, up from naught to five volts. Let's say that's a typical computer signal. And the cable uh, is long, and the, the, the signal that's sending the 5 volts into this 
doesn't know what's at the other end of the cable. Uh, so what can it do? How much current can it put in? Well, what it does is it looks at the local inductance and the local capacitance of the cable, and uh, it does a little calculation of those, and that gives it uh, a, a figure for what's called the characteristic impedance of the cable. So it puts in that amount of current, and if it was 5 volts and 50 ohms, it would be 100 milliamps. So this 100 milliamps goes charging on the cable, and it gets to the other end. Now, if there is a 50 ohm resistor there, by happy chance, it thinks, oh, that's good, it's all right, ohm's laws can be obeyed, and it, it sends 100 milliamps into this 50 ohm resistor. But if it's open circuit, you've got 100 milliamps with nowhere to go. The only place it can go is go back again. And the only way it can do that is if it raises uh, um, uh, another more voltage, 10 volts, to drive it back across the source again. Now, I think that the same thing will be happening uh, with the drive from the sun and the moon off at Cape Cod, sending signals in to wa as waves or across to us. And that Z is supposed to represent uh, that impedance. And this is a thing that's uh, stopping very large amounts of water flowing. Now, when it gets here, it's m meeting a resistive impedance, uh, which is a bed friction coefficient times the length of the channel times the square of the velocity. Now, I thought that was a nice, easy little equation to solve until I tried solving it. And fortunately, I, well, I couldn't do it at all, but fortunately, I knew a Frenchman who's sitting over there, Gregory Payne, who could solve it for me. And that's the solution, <laughs> all right? And this allows me to construct a whole bunch of signals which are based on the astronomical forcing function, but having gone through a controlled amount of losses. And here, what I've got is the, the red at the top is the astronomical forcing function, and the blue curves are a set of different friction coefficients, okay? And you can see that if we've got a, I wish I could see my mouse, but here it is. If we've got a red one up here, you can see that there's quite a big drop down to the first blue and an even bigger down to here. But if we go to these sorts of places with the small signal, there's hardly any difference between the red and the first blue. Okay. So this is Gregory Payne's solution to uh, bed frictions. And what I can do is to... Uh, oh, this is showing that the, the slope, the, the, start again, that th this th allows me to test the measure of the slopes for different friction coefficients. And this is better than the peak ones, but we're still only getting one data point for every zero crossing. So it's an, an advance, but it's still not quite, quite enough. The next thing we can think about is looking at the Fourier transform. Now, a Fourier transform is a way to get information about all the frequencies in a messy, complex signal. And if you have a, uh, a sine wave, you've only got a single tooth in the Fourier transform, which is saying all the energies of this one frequency. If you have a square wave, you have the fundamental, and you have a third of that amount in the third harmonic, and a fifth of that amount in the fifth harmonic, and so on, you get a series. So by seeing what the harmonics are, you can see how much a sine wave has been chopped. All right? And uh, I was able to get a, uh, a computer prediction for what the velocity should be in the Pentland Firth from a, a leading oceanographic laboratory. And that's the blue uh, signal. Uh, I've actually plotted it upside down so to compare it with the top one. And you can see we've got M2 being, uh, I've normalized things so M2 comes up at 1. So we've got a frequency along the horizontal axis, and I've got an M2, and I've got some stuff at about, uh, for, for, for S2, and then there's something at, at double the M2, and then not much. But the red one above that is the uh, Fourier transform of a real signal that was measured uh, with an acoustic Doppler current profiler. I've sized them so that they are fairly, fairly similar, but you can see there's lots of higher harmonics. And I thought this might be a great way to measure uh, the, uh, how much losses have been by just looking at the ratio of the high harmonics and the low harmonics. And unfortunately, this looked very good if I took a, 
uh, 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 the astronomical forcing function, which is the red ones there, and put it through uh, the Gregory Payne equation to get the bottom stuff there. This is looking an extremely nice way to do it. Unfortunately, the real signals that you get from acoustic Doppler current profiles have quite a lot of high frequency noise on their own. So we could say, well, we'll measure how much high, fre high frequency we've got and subtract a little bit off the acoustic Doppler one, but uh, that is a bit dodgy. I think this method would work very well if we could get better and better and better signal to noise ratio, and that's happening in the acoustic Doppler uh, um, instruments. They are very good indeed, very useful. But uh, still, it's not, uh, it's open to a lot of argument. So, that's it. This problem is noise. So the next thing to look at is the histogram of, uh, the, of the acoustic uh, um, velocity data. And the, the way this uh, system would work would be we'd start off taking the real acoustic Doppler signal here. Now they, they give this to you in a, a, in a speed rather than velocity. But fortunately, they also give you the a direction. And you can use the direction signal as a very efficient switch to reinvert the, um, uh, the, the speed signal to get a positive and negative velocity signal. So we, we do that. We have to look for some dropouts. And a lot of uh, signals from acoustic Doppler current profiles that uh, are picking up information near the surface where there's a breaking wave can get messed up by bubbles. Uh, the speed of sound with the bubble is, is enormously much lower than, than in water. So we have to do a bit of uh, surgery on that. And in fact, I've found that it's better to use uh, things that are about three quarters up to the surface rather than the actual surface itself. So we want to, to get that. And we want to calculate the root mean square value of that signal and also to get the histogram of it. Meanwhile, down here, we take the uh, uh, components of the acoustic, sorry, of the astronomical forcing function, and we push this through two attenuators. And the first one is a linear attenuator, which uh, cleans up the, which changes from the, the M2 equals 100 to uh, to give us uh, a, 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 a nice number in meters per second. And we put it through a square law one uh, here, which is going to represent the, the, the bed friction losses. So it's going through two attenuators, and then we put the signals from HRMS and the, the histogram into a box here, and we compare them with these two signals that are here. And we have to adjust the values of these two attenuators so that the RMS values are the same and the histograms the same shape. All right? And that allows us to say what the friction uh, losses would have been uh, of, of, uh, on the seabed. It's a bit tortuous. I'm sure that somebody here could find a way to make this automatic. But I've done it just simply by a series of pokings and adjustings until these numbers come out right. It takes about five minutes, and I'm sure you could do it in a flash. So the answer here is telling us uh, this much friction will make the, sh the shapes right. We have a bit of a problem in that uh, that's what the histogram of the original harmonics was like. When I first did this, I made a typing error, and it came out absolutely beautifully aligned with the Gaussian distribution in blue. But um, it's not, when I corrected it, there's a little bit of a uh, 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 cutting off at the, the skirts and a little bit of a drop off in the middle. Uh, and we're using all the data points, but we now have the problem of comparing the shapes of histograms. So what I've got here is a series of different friction coefficients here, like that. And again, going, you see how they're getting smaller. And that's the, uh, th this is a, the, a rather low loss and we're getting more and more losses here with more and more drop out in the middle and chopping off the skirts. So these are different ratios of power density. I think that's, yeah, that's 16 and that's, that's a rather big one. And then what you do is you look at these and you look at the histograms from real 
velocity uh, measurements in real water, and you'd say, well, that one looks about the same as somewhere around here. Now, I'm not going to say which I think is right. I'd like you to look at those and see where you think it might be. But we're talking about um, probably more than 16 and less than, less than 30. I'd like to find a better way to do it, and I've tried using uh, a correlation coefficient of the histogram shape, and that's, that's giving us numbers that are quite, uh, quite useful. Um, now, uh, what's, the, what's all this saying? Well, uh, if we look at pictures of typical tidal stream turbines, this is a random selection, and uh, the only thing that's in common with them is that there are enormous gaps between rotors, absolutely enormous gaps between rotors. And uh, I'm saying that this is uh, wrong and that we need to really understand uh, what I call the flow impedance. Uh, the, and the flow impedance is, uh, I, I define that as the ratio of the change of head to the reduction of flow rate if you put an obstruction in. Okay? And uh, it would be something like this, the funny units. But if I multiply that head ratio to flow rate change by rho g, I can use the equations which electrical engineers love about power. Uh, it's impedance times flow squared or head squared over impedance. Uh, and what we need to do is to use a different turbine design, something like this, uh, with, uh, instead of having the, uh, a, a very small blockage, we want to block absolutely as much as we possibly can. And we don't want to call it blockage anymore. We want to call it sweepage because we are sweeping across this area rather than blocking it. You, if you've got a high impedance flow, and we don't know what it is, but if it's, if it's high, you don't block it. You just sweep through it. Right, and if you do if you do this, you find that you can't pack uh, circles very tightly. It's much better to pack rectangles together, and so we want to go to the shape on the right. And what this might look like is this. And uh, when you work out, this, this is a vertical axis machine. The the yellow bit stays put, and it's got um, a number of legs going down here into the seabed, sloping legs. And everything below the yellow bit, the red bits and the silvery bits, are rotating. And the, the blades here are having to change their pitch angle as, they, as you go around. And what we are trying to do is to present the same pressure drop across the whole front of the rotor. Um, so you have to have an active pitch change. But the blades are a lot shorter than the blades uh, in... Um, uh, certainly in wind turbines, but even in other tidal rotor turbines. And they're also supported at both ends, which is a very nice thing for reducing the bending stresses. Um, so what we want to do is to adjust the pitch of the angle of the blade to get a certain amount of force here in the downstream direction. Now, uh, then if you imagine that we've sliced the, the frontage of the, of the rotor into a lot of equal time slots, uh, we want to have a little bit less force in a narrow time slot and a more force in a, in a, in a wide time slot uh, up around here. And so the only way we can get a, 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 a force in the direction downstream is to get a lift force and take the component of the lift force. So we have the flow coming in here, we've got the tangential velocity of the blade around here. I've got to find out what angle of pitch would give me that amount of lift force to get that amount of downforce. And if I can do that, I can get almost the same um, uh, pressure drop across the whole of the frontage of the rotor. Uh, so if I do that, I, uh, I've got a, a, a system which is presenting a nice load to the uh, to the water flow, instead of stopping it dead in the middle, which is what the present things have, and accelerating it around the tips. So I can actually make the wake coming out of uh, the, uh, the rotor be cleaner than what, what went in. 
if I see that there's a bit of higher velocity than, than average, I can make it do a little bit more work there uh, and a little bit less in other places. Uh, so if we do this, we are finding that the energy resource independent first is, I think, at least 10. I'm, I'm not sure yet. Some things indicate about 20 times um, higher than the present official estimates. And um, uh, this is not a very popular thing to say uh, to the in present industry. Now, I was expecting to talk for uh, that amount of time. Uh, I, the timetable has been changed a little bit. I've got quite a lot of more uh, slides. They're not in any particular arrangement. So what I'm planning to do is to flash through those quickly. But shall we take any questions now? And then we'll have a perhaps answer some of the questions with some of the remaining slides. So, yeah. If you um, build a model of your Uh, I could. It would be quite expensive because I've got to make a pitch actuator for every blade. Um, I think the first experiment to do is to see what happens if you have contra-rotating blades uh, which are producing a vortex, contra-rotating vortices. What happens when these vortex, vortices mix? Uh, with horizontal axis things, you get a terrible mess Angus Creech will tell you exactly what it looks like. It's absolutely horrible. Uh, it's very dissipating, and no, nobody knows what angle it's going to be until they've got about 20 rotors downstream. But uh, we've got contra-rotating vortices. If they cancel each other out, we've got a way of recovering quite a lot of the energy in there. And we have made um, a couple of things. Wait, Angus could do that. Angus could do it as well. And we have uh, a PhD student, Ruin Zhao, who I'm afraid is not here today. Uh, she had to go to China. Um, so we, 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 we could do it, but it would be... I, I'd rather put the money into measuring the slope of the, of the pattern first. Sorry, Steve, just following up on that, you said a pitch actuator on each plane. That means you can't use a camera system. Right, there, is a, there, there has to be a pitch actuator for every blade. You actually need this anyway because you want to be able to let them flow in whichever direction they want when you're installing it. I don't think you could install them without having them able to feather around. So we have a pitch actuator in every blade, and I've got a pitch actuator designed that can fit inside the available diameter of, uh, of the foils. So they have th this pitch actuator all the way down, and I have to design them so I can get out the bottom one, even if the top one, you know, if the bottom one fails, I've still got, got to move on the top one. I can show you the drawings for this, but they're, they're coming up now. The, um, the power takeoff is t all in the... I'd better show you some pictures of that. I'll go zooming ahead. Well, that's the vortex mixing. The ones on the right are what happens if you have two contra-rotating vortices. So that's, that's suggesting that we might, they might vanish. Uh, by the way, this is a very nice thing about why it's a good idea to hold the blade at both ends. <laughs> Supposing you said to the, the stretcher bearers, sorry chaps, you've got to be at the same end of the stretcher. You know. this, is what, this is what all the wind turbines have to do, and this is what the tidal stream turbines are doing as well. Okay. So, um, now, this is what I wanted to show you. Here we are. This is the power takeoff. The, the red thing is a quad cam which is coming out of the screen at you. And running on that are four rollers, which are um, riding up and down on the crest and the troughs of the can. And the legs here are mine. That's the sort of size of it. It's a tiny, tiny thing. And each of these is going to be having a force of about 10 to the 5 newtons. And it's moving through about... Uh, 100 millimeters, so you're doing 10 to 4 mm. joules of work every time the cam load goes past. And you get an amazing power density out of this for a very low weight. Uh, now, that's how to make the cam. This is, yeah, this is the mess of the, what happens in the wake of a horizontal axis machine. So, the design, I haven't got the design of the pitch actuator, but you're right, we have to have one pitch actuator for each blade, and that's a whole 
There's four, so it's like a four of them. Right. Any more questions? Yes. Wait, could you speak up? My hearing's not very really good. I don't know. Um, let's go back and look again at... Here we are. Uh, these are co-rotating on the left-hand side and that gives a, a very hard, difficult to follow system. I really don't uh, see... I mean, that's not... That would be causing a lot of dissipation. But here, we're going down the page for different time steps. And the angular momentum is of contra-rotating vortices is equal and opposite, so that's going to go to zero. What happens to the kinetic energy? And what I want to do is to have, let's go back again. Um, I want to have the, the torques on two adjacent rotors will be producing opposite torques on the water around them. Uh, so I'm going to have water coming, looking at the leading edge of a rotor. One lot of water is going to want to come like that and it's going to meet another lot of water of the same velocity in exactly the opposite direction. So the only place that anything can do initially is to build up a ridge, a crest, of a, like a standing wave. And what happens after that is worth a PhD. Um, and uh, it, it, it will be some kind of standing wave pattern which will uh, be probably oscillating backwards and forwards. We'll be getting a sort of standing wave thing like that. Now, that, if we know what that's going to be, and we can put rotors in the right place, we can get energy from it. Uh, but it will, we really have to, to get the number from Ruin Zhao. Uh, you, you, can, you, you, you know, you can talk to her. Right? One was when you're looking at the, um, I think a lot of people do friction tests on the state of the depth profile yeah. using the laws of wall and you get a lot of differences. Well, that tells you exactly what's happening at that spot. It doesn't tell you what's happening up and down with those Swoner and Stromers. Yeah. And I guess it's like a kind of historical thing to explain what's happened at these different steps up here rather than yeah. points. Yeah. Well, you get a complete dropout in the signal. Um, I, this is an interesting number, but the speed of sound in, in uh, air is 340 meters a second. In water, it's about 1,500. If you have a mix of 50, 50 water air, the velocity is 20 meters a second. Absolutely astonishing. Right, so if you've got bubbles in... Uh, from a breaking wave, the acoustic Doppler doesn't have a chance of, you know, it's, it's relying on the speed of sound being the speed of sound in water. If you're too, yeah, if you're too close to the surface, there's bubbles, and th this shows up uh, as a n not a number, not a number. So you get you get this spreadsheet with a whole lot of lovely, useful data, and then you got a whole, you know, a, a minute or two of not numbers. Now you, sometimes you can patch them over by eye, uh, but sometimes you have to say, sorry, this is a bit too difficult, I have to describe it. I'm very impressed with what they do, so I really don't want to be seen to be criticising them. They're, they're, they're telling you exactly what, uh, what's happening, and it's jolly useful to know that there was a breaking wave there. Yeah, 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 right, okay, but there is still some noise and it's a question of how much of that you allowed for. If you, uh, uh, and this is, this is making, having quite a big effect on the, on the loss estimate. Sure. I certainly 
know if you make the assumption that for any given You, I watch out for the press gangs. They might be after you. <laughs> no, this is what I need to get. Well, the reason I want to do this is I want to get guys like you to help on this project. Um, okay, that's the time. Thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.